Welcome to the webinar. Thank you for joining us for this, the second of a three-part vision showcase with CNIB Frontier Accessibility and their partners. Today, the folks from CNIB Frontier Accessibility are joined by representatives from Humanware. This webinar is hosted by the Network of Assistive Technologists on this Friday, the 16th of April, 2021. So please join me in welcoming today's presenters. Uh, Andrea Voss joins us uh, from CNIB Frontier Accessibility, where she has been helping blind or partially sighted students for over 20 years. As an expert in assistive devices and technologies, Andrea is the overall educational lead and manages support for English speaking students in Ontario and Atlantic Canada. Also from CNIB Frontier Accessibility, Marianne Bent joins us today. As a pioneer in the world of navigation and wayfinding for those who are blind or partially sighted, Marianne leads the CNIB Frontier Accessibility Navigation and Wayfinding efforts, focusing on one goal, making the built environment accessible for all. And joining us from Humanware, one of CNIB's partners, is Michelle Pepin. And as part of Humanware, the Humanware team, Michelle has worn many hats during his 18-year career. Currently, he is responsible for developing the distribution channels in Canada, and he is a strong advocate on the importance of assistive technology and its role on the lives of those living with vi visual impairment. We're also joined today by Peter Tusik, the branded Bass Ambassador of Blindness Products for Humanware. Peter travels the U.S. supporting teachers and students as well as presenting at state and national conferences. Prior to Humanware, Peter ran the National Assistive Technology Help Desk at the Chicago Lighthouse for the Blind. So welcome, Andrea, Marianne, Michelle, and Peter. Thank you for joining us today. And with that said, I do want to hand the presentation over to you, to you folks today. And I think um, Andrea is going to start us off today. So I'll just stop my screen sharing and allow Andrea to take control of that. So go ahead, Andrea. Thank you. Let me just see I, if I'm successful in my screen sharing attempt. All right. All right. Can we see my screen, CNIB, Be My Eyes and Learn Style Partnerships? Yep, everything's good to go, Andrea. Okay, wonderful. Well, thanks so much for allowing us to be here again. This, as uh, Doug had said, this is the second part of a three-part series where we are really spotlighting um, partnerships with um, our premier technology providers. Um, today, as Doug said, you'll be hearing from uh, Michelle and Peter from Humanware. Um, but in addition to providing technology, products and technology, Frontier Accessibility as part of that social enterprise arm of the CNIB, we are trying to expand the access to um, accessible solutions across the country. So Marianne is going to talk a little bit later about navigation and wayfinding. And right now, just briefly, I'm going to touch upon a couple of the other partnerships, Be My Eyes and Learn Style. So what is Be My Eyes? You may already be quite familiar with Be My Eyes, which is a free app that can be downloaded on a mobile phone. And the, the direction or the goal of this app is to provide some sighted assistance to a blind or low vision person. And um, the app allows that person to connect with a volunteer. Um, and that volunteer provides that sighted assistant through a live video call. So um, Be My Eyes was launched in 2015 and already has over 4 million registered volunteers. The service is available in 180 languages. And I actually have a video that I'm going to show you just in case you're not familiar with the service that best, you know, best explains what it is. Um, afterwards, I'm going to touch upon specialized help, which was added in February, 2018. You might wonder how blind people deal with everyday challenges. Normally, the answer is simple. We're not that different from you. We play music. We go to school. We go to work. You get the picture. But sometimes, the simplest things can be difficult, and we need a pair of eyes. 
connect to. That's where you come in. Establishing video connection. Through your smartphone, Be My Eyes connects the blind with sighted people through a live video connection. Simply choose if you need help or want to help by the click of a button. That's a nice picture of you and your family, Caroline. Is it for a present? <laughs> yes, it's a photo from my parents. You can help just by installing the Be My Eyes app. Image. And we'll notify you when someone needs your help. And if you're in the middle of something, don't worry. Someone else will step in. <laughs> so, would you care to be my eyes? So that gives you an idea of what the Be My Eyes app is. Um, but now I'm talking about specialized support so or specialized help. So specialized help um, essentially takes the power of the Be My Eyes solution and connects it directly to trained staff rather than the usual volunteer assistance pool. Um, specialized help service gives the option to route the customer assistance calls to either your own contact center or to tr uh, CNIB trained uh, Be My Eyes specialists. So I believe at the CNIB, we're implementing Be My Eyes at Work, which um, allows sighted individuals from the CNIB organization to provide sighted assistance to our blind and low vision colleagues within the CNIB. So that's an option that um, we have available for organizations, um, but we also have help available for organizations that deal with customers, people from without, you know, outside of the organization. So if you can ever think about, you know, calling customer service for, you know, a company like Bell or Rogers, and um, that tech support person is asking you when your internet isn't working, if you can go to the modem and make sure the light is on, well, um, obviously sighted assistance would be beneficial in that uh, situation. Or, you know, with Microsoft being a partner of Be My Eyes, you know, so sometimes people are asked to find small serial numbers at the bottom of a laptop or something along those lines. Again, sighted assistance um, and specialized help is, is very beneficial in that regard as well. Um, interestingly, there is a picture with many um, logos to the right of this slide. And one of those logos is for clear blue. So if you're not familiar with clear blue, they uh, make pregnancy tests. And um, I was watching um, a video of the Clear Blue customer support who had the CNI, uh, who had the Be My Eyes specialized help solution. And to think how valuable that is for someone who, you know, really requires sighted assistance because the only indicator that someone is pregnant or not pregnant is the appearance of a, a line, a blue line. So really sort of cherishing that privacy, um, even if there's someone else that this person who took the test could go to, that, that information should be um, not shared at that time. And I really think that is it's so beneficial and, and you know, really forward of Clear Blue to allow that Be My Eyes um, specialized help to have that support for their customers. All right, so, and the next partnership that I will touch upon is our partnership with LearnStyle. So, LearnStyle is a training company. Um, they also have a um, specialized, customizable um, student service software that is um, related to a student's individual education plan. But really, we um, were attracted to LearnStyle because of their unique approach to providing training. Um, I think initially, they provided training to students um, in special education who had certain learning disabilities. And then they broadened horizons and started to um, provide services to students with multiple exceptionalities. And also now they provide training to students who are blind or have low vision. And um, they have contracts with about 60 school boards in Ontario. And they certainly have the um, coaching and training contract for two of the larger school boards, one being the Peel District School Board and the other one being the York Region District School Board. So in August of 2020, we partnered with LearnStyle. 
And um, so essentially, it, when you do buy products like human wear products, for example, from CNIP, the school board does that for their students, um, then the training that accompanies that product is delivered by a learn style training coach. And, um, you know, it's they have a different approach. They have a very developmental approach to when they deliver training. So um, depending on which tool or which feature um, that the student um, you know, uses. It's not really like an operational training where they're learning A to Z all about the device that they are, that they have just purchased, but it's, it's a very unique approach, step-by-step, step, just enough training on the device and also um, skills related to what's going on in the classroom at the same time. So um, they have a shared mission with us and we just want to, in the end, empower students to live with confidence and independence. And since our partnership, LearnStyle has hired uh, more blind and low vision technology coaches. We, they've also hired um, blind and low vision bilingual technology coaches because we want to ensure as we expand our services across the country that we can provide training in both of our languages, national languages, and be able to um, ensure that we're supporting all of the French school boards and school districts across the country. Okay, so. Now, I think that uh, I will stop my sharing and turn it over to Peter and Michelle. Thank you so oh, much, go. Andrea. And I'm going to have Michelle tell you who he is before I, I'm going to share some slides and kind of run through some pieces. My name is Peter Tusick, and I'm the brand ambassador of Blindness Products for Human Wear. Um, but I'm joined by Michelle. And Michelle, uh, if you want to tell everybody who you are and what you do, and I will take over with the screen share and run some slides. Thank you, Peter. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Peter, for jumping in. Of course, uh, what, what I call a rookie move, did not unmute myself after Andrea stopped, uh, uh, transferred the, uh, the mic to me. So anyway, uh, thank you very much uh, for, for being there this afternoon, guys. My name is Michelle Pepin from HumanWare. I am the sales director for Canada. And we're really pleased to be here this afternoon to share with you, uh, for Peter, primarily to share with you his vision as to how uh, refreshable braille display has, has grown over the years. I mean, humanware, for those of you who are not familiar with humanware, we, we're We've been manufacturing product for the blindness low vision industry for like over 30 years now. And of course, the, 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 the braille devices that we've manufactured has always been a, a strong core for humanware. And in recent year with the developing technology, we were able to embed a lot of this, this uh, I'll call mainstream technology in, in our, our devices to make them not just more accessible, but offer more uh, flexibility to what the device could do and what you could do with each of the devices. So uh, we're really fortunate to have Peter. Uh, Peter, I think in the, part of the introduction You've uh, all heard that he's, uh, although he's not traveling as much now these days, but Peter basically is, is in high demand uh, to speak at different conferences and do a lot of um, in-service and training to talk about these, these devices. And Peter being a uh, user himself, I wanted him to be able to share his view as to how he sees the evolution of Braille display and specifically where the Braille displays are today. And of course, we'll be talking a little bit about what humanware, what we've done over the year and what we have now uh, made uh, available in the last few months uh, through a, a new edition of Braille display, uh, what, what I call the new era of Braille display or smart Braille display. And uh, Peter will definitely be able to provide us his own view as how he uses this and how he sees this as well application um, benefiting for every uh, blind and uh, blind user, sorry, uh, using different uh, different Braille uh, devices. So without any uh, delay, Peter, I think I'll turn it back to you. I see your slides are up and running, so take it over. Boom. All right. Thanks so much, Michelle. And for those of you uh, who don't know who I am, as, as everyone has kind of said, I'm the brand ambassador of Blindness Products. I am from Chicago. Uh, I am totally blind and I'm a user. I mean, I, I do lots of work on the front end as well as on the back end with a lot of these products. So I certainly do lots of conference presentations. Um, I do a lot of that front facing side with one on one trainings with students with users with decision makers or teachers, uh, lots of education. And then I also will um, kind of have a channel into the back end with helping our product management team and uh, the development side of things move in the directions that we need to be moving to stay current with the technology. Today, um, we're going to be looking really at a, a reflection 
of refreshable Braille through the lens of human wear and really looking at, I'm going to rip through some slides. Normally, I, I mean, I can do this in about an hour 40, but I'm going to do it in about 18 minutes um, to really go through kind of where we've gone um, and how we've gotten to where we are today and then focus on a couple of new products. In regard to kind of what we'll be talking about, I mean, really it's how technology has advanced um, and looking at the sort of work and play expectations of today. Uh, we'll talk about manual tools and kind of how they they kind of bring it everything forward. We start with that manual side of things and we move forward into uh, where we are, you know, as adult blind professionals or braille reading hobbyists or whatever it may be, where we're using that multiple set of tools or tools in our toolbox. In re regard to where we will go um, in terms of our uh, specific agenda, um, we'll talk about why didn't my slides go forward? Sorry about that. There we go. Um, in terms of, you know, it, when we look at expectations, right, we know that in any environment, uh, whether it's work or school, we're all expected to contribute and kind of complete tasks no different than from our sighted peers. And also, it's no different from several years ago. Um, in many cases, we do have to use multiple tools. There is no one size fits all solution. As much as I wish there was, as much as we all would like to use one tool, be it an iPad to do everything, be it a uh, your, your PC to do everything. If you're a Braille user, and mainly if you're a, a user of any piece of assistive technology, we're going to be putting multiple tools in the toolbox. With that being said, our goal is to try and minimize those tools or combine or make hybrid versions of tools to bring us into more of a, a, a single sort of use case. But we still will be using multiple tools depending on the situation that we find ourselves in. The expectations that I have here listed in bullet points are so things like touch typing. Um, we need to be able to quickly take notes. We need to be able to stay current, right? Our sort of appointment scheduling. Um, I do have time and date in here, which is very, <laughs> very obvious to us, you know, now, especially in terms of uh, keeping track of what day it is uh, during the pandemic and just being at home. We need to have basic word processing skills, kind of that Google, or as I call it here, extremely basic web searching, but being able to quickly call and recall facts and information. Um, we want to be able to gamify things. We know the importance of having educational tools, but we also need to have uh, sort of that that side of things that brings in the game gamifying or making it more goal oriented or achievable through uh, sort of a, an energy rich experience as a lot of modern people will call this but it's really just gamifying education um, we need to be able to present I am an avid PowerPoint user I'm running slides right now I do that with a Braille display it is a very crucial skill for somebody who's totally blind um, to be able to present visual information or use visual aids. We also need to be able to collect data and we need to be able to read and, and comprehend um, and recall, again, refer to previous information and such. So those, those bullet points, and you could have many slides of bullet points and really dissect them, but at its most basic level, that's what we're seeking to do with any product we build. When we build a product, we try to do um, you know, try to, to think of and, and really allow somebody who is six years old or 96 or over um, to be able to use the product. And again, it's, it's a hard thing to do because we find ourselves trying to uh, work with education or hobbyists or retirees or blind professionals. And we're trying to accommodate all of these needs in simple, easy to use intuitive devices. So regardless of kind of where we get to, we all start with hard copy or manual Braille. You know, when I talk about this a lot, and, and I'm always asked, when is my student or when when is my child or when will I be ready for refreshable Braille? And the answer is always once you understand the layout of a Braille page, once you can read hard copy Braille, and we learn on a manual Brailler. Braille is still certainly used today, if not more today than at any time in the past because of the access to information that we all have um, on a daily basis. We're using Braille displays to access everything, but hard copy Braille and manual Braille is still always used. Um, we use it to teach spatial concepts. What is an indent? What is a centered line? Obviously, if you're older and you're newer to vision loss, you know what that is, but somebody who is young, who's developing reading skills, who's developing math skills, um, we're using hard copy Braille to do that. We use it, again, for document creation. We talk about 
indenting and, and columns and all of that stuff, as well as better understanding what is a spreadsheet? What is information that is presented visually? How do you get somebody who has never seen anything in their life um, to comprehend or, or take this sort of information into account? I still use Braille to label household objects. Um, my wife is sighted, so it's easy for me. I can always borrow a pair of eyes if I really need one, but I certainly will take Braille in com combination with bump dots or other pieces to label um, certain settings on all of these crazy appliances that kind of exist today. Um, even even appliances that are not touchscreen, you still, you know, you, when they are touchscreen, you can certainly use things like bump dots, but for manual appliances, washing machines and various pieces, we're still using Braille labeling. Also on our clothes that we wear, we can sew in Braille labeling tags and things like that. So hard copy Braille or manual Braille is still absolutely relevant. It's still needed and it's still going to be part of the part of the puzzle. When I talk about the beginning of, in this slide, really the beginning of digital tools, and I'm really referring to digital tools for Braille readers or writers. Uh, this really started with the Braille and Speak and other Braille, early Braille note takers in the 90s. And I am a product of the 90s, so this is very relevant to me. And there were products previous, the Pocket Brailler or the Versa Braille and others that really started in the early 80s um, and, and some even in the late 70s. But when we think about portable uh, digital Braille tools, the Braille and Speak was that first tool. It gave us the ability to input in Braille, and this is very important because we could electronically create documents and print them in you know, hard copy for our teacher, our colleagues, whomever. We could translate on the fly from Braille to print. Uh, there was a way to do that, and we had not been able to, to use many mainstream programs up to that point. It gave us the ability to edit, to write, documents in Braille, so doing it in our medium. And a lot of times as Braille users, and I'll get to this in future slides, but we're we're terrible at spelling. We don't read enough of the world around us. We're always kind of relying on verbal communication, which is fantastic. We oftentimes have great vocabularies, but when it comes to written communication skills, we, we certainly suffer. Um, or even if we had those skills, once we, we don't read anymore um, and we're just consuming everything auditorily, we, we certainly let that lapse as well. And there's nothing wrong. I'm a heavy, heavy audio user. I use screen readers all the time. I use voiceover on my iPhone. I use lots and lots of auditory feedback all day. But Braille is a very consistent piece of everything that I do. This also gave us for the first time on that Braille and Speak side, uh, the ability to manage files and folders. So staying organized, uh, being able to organize is another skill that sometimes we lack because we keep so much information in our heads as blind kiddos. Um, and, and we're really good at it until we're not. So we were able to kind of bring that file and folder management and help with those organization skills. And if there's anything that's crucial to succeeding in the professional world, it is good organizational skills. Um, I certainly had struggled with that as a kiddo a lot, uh, being able to keep things in order, in the right place. And it helped tremendously when I went to college and didn't have a good support system, uh, being able to have good time management and organizational skills. We also were, we had auditory feedback on the device. So it did reinforce what we were typing. It reinforced what we were doing um, on the device, but we had no Braille output. And that was one of the drawbacks to those original Braille input tools. And that's what brought us to where humanware really comes into play. And that is with the Braille note taker. All of the same pieces, but we were able to have refreshable Braille output in addition to the input. In addition to working in our medium, we were able to read the world around us. We were able to have access to uh, mainstream content uh, like documents and pieces in Braille as well as a book reader. So for the first time we had that book reading side of things, bringing in textbooks, bringing in um, you know any of those pieces in electronic format and that was really the, the beginning of Bookshare and all the Benetech pieces but being able to read that in Braille was a huge step forward. We started to work with advanced word processing, which is a great skill. We need to know the importance of visually formatting or creating documents and understanding those pieces, not just on hard copy Braille, but we need to prepare and create documents in a, in a sighted world. We need to follow MLA or APA or Chicago style formatting and things. Um, we were able to quickly edit via cursor placement, which is something we were not familiar with until really that, that Braille display gave us the ability on these devices like the braille light or the braille note uh, gave us the ability to quickly edit and manipulate text not just do it through verbal feedback we were able to also turn that speech off we could silently read silently take notes in class and that was a big step forward we didn't have to have the auditory feedback in our ear whether it was a headphone that might be distracting or speech that was distracting everybody around us it also gave us access to email and external drives and some of those pieces 
um, that we hadn't had access to in a simple way. There were screen readers out there, but they really did not give us that full uh, benefit of being able to access some of these pieces. Keysoft was born, and I will we'll get to really what that means when I talk about the intelligent displays, but it gave us the ability to easily navigate through first letter navigation, a suite of onboard apps that were designed for a Braille user. And that's a big piece because we were designing content, designing you know this, this kind of layout for somebody who is blind, who thinks in a linear way, um, who uses menus and lists as opposed to spatial layout when it comes to screens and such. The Braille note taker was great, but as we moved forward, when we got into about that 2008, 9, 10 period, we had to start thinking about other uses and we saw mainstream technology becoming very accessible. This led us to the Braille display sort of market. Um, Braille display has provided mainstream access, right? We have operating systems that are off the shelf accessible. So voiceover, I remember my first device that ran voiceover just being absolutely amazed that I could use the same device that my peers were using um, at this point, it was something like an iPod Touch. Uh, but the point being that we could just turn this on and off the shelf, it was accessible. What it didn't give us, though, was Braille output. And so we needed devices that would interface with these mainstream screen readers like JAWS, like NVDA, like Supernova, um, VoiceOver, TalkBack. All of these screen readers needed to have Braille output because, again, the, the verbosity is wonderful. Uh, we want to have that good output and that good speech but in, in all of that access, but we need to be reading. This gave us access to documents, to spreadsheets, to websites um, in our medium and in real time. We didn't have to have them converted for us or things like that. So again, accessibility and usability took a major step forward, but we were able to access real time communication as well. So think about texting, instant messaging in Braille. Um, you know, it, it really opened up a lot of doors and then it gave us access to some of those third-party applications in Braille. So if we're banking or we're doing anything else, we can simply, we at that point in time could say, well, I'm going to use my Braille display and keep my phone in my pocket. Um, Braille expanded exponentially here. We, we always hear about Braille is dying and all these things. And as I said, it's, it's completely and entirely the opposite in terms of I can read the New York Times every morning in Braille. Um, I can do all of these things that nobody could do up to this point unless you wanted to have some very specialized support structures in place um, to have this content created for you. So it really was a major step forward to have out-of-box access in our medium. Moving forward, and, and I again, I, I kind of do this in steps. I talked about the note taker and then the braille display and then how those evolved as well. So we needed to come up with a modern note taker. What we noticed was the products were great. They had all this onboard stuff, but they could not interact with their interface with mainstream devices. So we had to come up with a way to combine access to third-party apps with onboard Braille translation and sort of that inbuilt Keysoft experience allowing for you to kind of create printed math and science and all of these things and get them to your connected classroom or worth workplace in the same time or at the same point as your sighted peers or colleagues. We knew that we already had a familiar environment for users. We knew that the Braille note was known and that the environment was known, but we needed to bring it into something that would correspond to or work with this sort of mainstream world. Um, we wanted, and, and our goal was to make it easily to access content and really learning management systems, both for the classroom as well as for the connected workplace. Learning management systems would be something like Google Classroom or Canvas or Schoology, and then also access to the cloud. Um, being able to bring in access to Google Drive or Dropbox or other places. We've also expanded this to involve the use of learning tables, which are really allow somebody who is not familiar with fully contracted Braille to grow into their device. This is something that's available through Duxbury, but we were able to bring it on board. So you're not fully living in uncontracted or contracted Braille. Um, we now have wireless access to textbooks. Um, it's, I mean, it really was, is a no-brainer that we would, but it's something that we needed to bring into a device with the usability of Keysoft, because we certainly can use our iPhones. We certainly can use all of these tools around us to read books and things, but the usability is not always there for a Braille first user. Talk about modern sort of note takers and what that led us to in this last year, which is really the conclusion of this, is I'll talk about the intelligent or modern Braille displays. You know, we, we had the Braille display, as I mentioned. It gave us access to the iPhone. It gave us access to screen readers. It gave us access to all of this third-party sort of content or mainstream out-of-box accessibility. 
But what, what it didn't do is it, it did leave out that Braille first experience. And we have a lot of individuals who don't want a full fledged note taker. They don't need math and science. They don't need all of this advanced stuff because they can do that. They can do many of these tasks on their computers. But what they wanted was more functionality out of a standalone product. So we developed Keysoft Lite, which is going to be a basic suite of applications to provide familiar environment or familiar access in a Braille centric way to uh, internal applications, but then also gives you the ability to work with all of your screen readers. And we also were able to include access to online libraries. And right now in Canada, that is still being developed. I mean, right now it's very centric to Bookshare, NFB Newsline, and uh, the NLS Braille catalog here in the States. Those libraries will grow, um, but we really wanted to focus on bringing forward a product that was more intelligent, more of a hybrid approach. We do have a, an onboard basic word processor. So we do have Braille translation. You can create documents and simply and easily get them off the device to cited peers through a, through a basic editor. Um, you can connect to multiple devices. We know that, and this is not new to unique to our Braille display, but we know that everybody doesn't just have one iPhone. Everybody has uh, multiple devices. You might switch from your computer to your iPhone, to your tablet, to uh, some other devices. So we wanted to bring that in. The, the devices have Wi-Fi capabilities. Uh, the ability to download audiobooks uh, will come at some point, right? We're going to have audio access. But the wireless is also used to bring in, um, in addition to books, to bring in our updates. We can update the device wirelessly. When we're ready, which we are almost ready to launch our first update to the product, which will bring in PDF support and some other pieces, that will be a wireless update. We just push it to our users as is expected from devices today. We have access to common document types, DOCX, RTF, you know, a lot of those those text files. We also have a an in, inbuilt book reader so we can access HTML or uh, Daisy books and all of these other formats that are commonly used in our community as well as just in textbooks in general. All right. Kind of dive in um, specifically here to the BI40X. What sets so there are two models, the 20 and the 40 in terms of our intelligent braille displays here. Um, the Brilliant 40X has Bluetooth 5. It has supports wireless 2.4 and 5 gigahertz networks. So again, modern protocols with Bluetooth 5 were the first display to have it. Um, we have stereo speakers when audio is active, which it is not at the current moment. When it is, it is active, we do have stereo speakers on the device. So it's not a matter of if it will happen. It's just a matter of time to implement that as a free upgrade to the product. There is a microphone on the BI40X, so we want you to be able to record notes. We also know that there could be expanded possibilities as we go forward, um, just with the internet over things and, and various ways we can utilize Bluetooth 5. We also, uh, on the device, have support for thumb drives. Again, we have that quick folder management, file management, so we can quickly take files and move them onto a thumb drive to get them onto your PC. We're also using USB-C in all our products, so it doesn't matter what way you plug it in. Your products will also show up as a mass storage device on your computer. Command keys are still here, just like they were on the previous Brilliant BI uh, models. So the new 20 and 40X models will, will have, um, uh, I'm sorry, the 40X models will have command keys. In regard to the BI 20X, we are going to be talking kind of a, a, the same type of product with a smaller footprint, and there are some physical differences. So we're using Bluetooth 4.2. Um, we support wireless 2.4 gigahertz networks. We have a mono speaker as opposed to stereo. There is no microphone on the device, um, but we do have access for SD cards as well as thumb drives on the 20X. The battery is replaceable. Um, both will get in that 20 hour battery range um, in terms of, of how long the battery will last. And again, for displays that are very connected, that is awesome. Um, it's something that we have not seen on a product that will have access to Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and all these good things out for a Braille sort of display, um, with just a strictly a Braille display. So there are two models of the products. The final piece here that I want to touch on is the Mantis Q40. The Mantis Q40 is really one of a kind. It is a full QWERTY laptop style keyboard, so there's no number pad, uh, but it is able to bring in the concept of that Braille display and Bluetooth keyboard in one device. The product allows you to type and work in a QWERTY environment using all the screen reader native commands you know, right? So you transfer sort of your skills when you, when you learn your QWERTY typing. You take that with you to the PC. You take that with you wherever you may be going. 
um, and you're able to roll through and use those same commands with the braille display inbuilt right across the bottom of the unit. So it is a 40 cell braille display with a Manta, uh, I'm sorry, with a QWERTY style keyboard. Um, these devices do run on the Linux platform, the 20, the 40, the, the uh, uh, Mantis, they're, they're running Linux as their sort of operating base. We're using Bluetooth 4.2 on the Mantis and access to wireless again for downloading books, for bringing in uh, wireless you know, updates, being able to update the devices. And this is something, this product was developed by Humanware for the Ameri American Printing House for the Blind. They came to us with a quote uh, for kind of developing product. We were able to come through and, and develop it. It is distributed by us internationally, uh, but it is certainly something that is part of the APH portfolio as well. The device can support SD cards, and it, it is, again, just bringing that, that thought of what can we do to push forward Braille displays? How can we in sort of, uh, not, not, it's not even innovation, it's really thinking about a new category of this is not just a standalone Braille terminal. Um, this is not a full-fledged note taker. We know that many of our users need something in the middle. It is also version one, so we are going to look at innovation. We're going to look at I talk about the X in Brilliant, B-I-X, meaning 10 years. So the Brilliant has been around 10 years. We want this product to get us through many years to come. Um, we're looking at this decade as being viable and relevant for this product. So we need to have a new appreciation for what a Braille display can do. And we want to push the envelope there. And I, I, I really believe we are doing that. All right. I want to say thank you. Um, I really appreciate everybody being here. And I, I know, again, I'm ripping through these slides. Michelle says always that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in demand, but I do have to go present to California. I have a couple hour presentation coming for CTE BVI, um, which I certainly will go do. But I, I know there are some questions in the chat, which I've, I've kind of heard fly by as I do this. So um, there I'm are a couple sure of questions, Peter. Yeah, I, I can probably, uh, if I can relate to, and ask them to you. Anne was asking, does it, uh, does the Braille display reads EPUB book? So as of right now, the answer is no. That doesn't mean it won't happen. We've been asked to support EPUB in the Victor Reader application on the BI 20 and 40X, as well as the library application on the Mantis. So right now, no, but again, it's version one. So we're three months into this and I would be very, um, positive and, and, you know, in looking for EPUB support to come down the line. And her second part, uh, yeah, of her, of her question was, will, will there be any assistance to help individual acquire? I'm not sure if you're referring to be able to trial product before uh, and understanding how, how it works and what it does. If it is, uh, definitely there is a, a program that uh, Humanware uh, has put to, um, it's set up in Canada, and we work in conjunction with CNIB, with uh, Andrea here and Monica West, uh, called the loan program, meaning that if you want to trial one of Humanware uh, devices, you can uh, simply get in touch with Andrea, Monica, or myself, and then we uh, we will definitely set up a wait for you to ship you a device. You've got usually, we usually run those programs for about a week and a half to two weeks. Uh, if needs to be supported, uh, if you want to have a quick getting started, and, and uh, then a couple of days after, do a quick session, whether it's a Braille device with one of our Braille specialists or one of our low vision specialists, we are able to do so. And making sure you have a good uh, a good user experience as well, and, and giving you the full experience of trialing a device without, uh, for you to be able to see what the device can do, and if it answers any, uh, any of your needs or students' needs, depending on where, um, where what you want to do with the device. The um, we had another question about uh, SD card size that it can use. What can what? Sorry, what kinds? What's SD card size can we use in the twenty and the Mantis? Uh, so it's going to be relatively. I mean, you, you, it really will depend on. I always say this with SD cards. It depends on who makes them. Um, you're going to easily be able to put a sixty-four gig card in these devices. Thirty-two for sure. I will have someone out there tell me I used a 128 or I used a 256. Sizes are, you know, it, it is something that in today's world we do so much with cloud storage. I do not see uh, too much physical storage still going on. We certainly support it. If you are able to find an SD card that works at a higher capacities, by all means, it, it most likely will. But I could see five different SD cards that say they support 64 gigs and three of them work and two of them do not. So. Um, the, the official word is 32, but you could certainly go higher depending on where you're acquiring those SD cards from. Another question we had, what about displaying math equation? 
math equations will not be supported internally, but that doesn't mean that you would not be able to use a screen reader. So something like MathML is supported by JAWS. You can certainly use math equations depending on where you are. It's a very, very open-ended question. Math equations, really, it depends on what are you trying to display. Are they just in Braille? If they're in BRF format, you can certainly open them up and display them internally. But if you're talking about math in a mainstream setting, you would be looking at using a screen reader or you're looking at using an online program like the Pearson Math Editor or other pieces um, and in various closed environments where math could certainly be supported. If you're thinking of math from the note taker side, like we support full Braille to print math flawless translation for a printed visual output, the answer is no, that is not part of the internal word processor. And then added, many blind individuals don't have money to purchase new devices. Totally agree with you on that one. And keep in mind that depending where, where you're from as well, I mean, many provinces have their own funding programs. Um, we're talking about uh, in Quebec, RAMQ, uh, that funds 100% of most of these assistive technologies. Uh, there's ADP in Ontario for, uh, I would say, at-home use, uh, although Colleges, university do have disability program. There are funding there as well through uh, post-secondary um, uh, education. Um, in K-12, I know that a lot of the schools, whether they work with a lending library such as said BC, APC in, uh, in Eastern Canada, I mean, there's different ways uh, to look into what kind of funding each province uh, makes available. And there, are, I, I, know, I know it's not every provinces that have, uh, that will give you access to funding, but in most of the provinces, there's ways for you to fundraise uh, or get some fundraising money as well to be able to put towards the, uh, the purchase of assistive technology. We do offer some uh, true human wear. We're, we are a for-profit company, so we're, we're, we don't necessarily do fundraising, but we do offer what we call um, a financing program as well to help um, uh, lower the, the burden of uh, the higher cost of some of the technology as, as we talked about today. But uh, by all means, once again, if you want to know more about this, you can get in touch with uh, Monica, uh, not Monica, sorry, Andrew and myself, and I'll be more than happy to, to share more of the funding depending on the province you're with. You're from. And I, again, want to thank everybody and thank you, Michelle. And I know we're going to get to Marianne and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I, I hope it was informative. I really raced through those slides, uh, certainly went very fast. So I know it's a, it's a lot to kind of take in from a, from a broad overview, but uh, we certainly are going to continue to innovate, build new types of products, build new footprints. So you see where, you know, we're offering smaller Braille displays, mid-level products with the hybrid approach. We still have the high-end Braille note takers. We do embossers. We do GPS. A very, very wide variety and entry levels of different, different product uh, subsets. So it, it really is something we'll continue to do. And I'm sure you'll hear from me again. And I'm sure you've many of you maybe have heard from me before. So uh, thank you tons, Doug and Andrea and everybody. Uh, for having having me in today, and I will uh, I'll turn it over to to Marianne. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate it. I was not aware that you had to leave partway through, so I, I very much appreciate all of your. Uh, oh, I, I will hang around as long as I can. I will yeah. I'll be here till uh, till I absolutely have to. But I certainly right. I, I don't want anyone to be surprised if I'm gone, <laughs> ghosting oh, everybody. <laughs> Yes, and we, we, we do have other uh, material to cover today, but I just wanted to interject and, and thank you before you did leave there, Peter, is, is uh, that was a wealth of information. Um, I, I have no idea how anybody in the world can, can memorize all that and figure it out and keep all the different products and, and, and history of it all straight. So um, you're a wealth of knowledge on that. And uh, um, Having a connection with you for our membership, uh, being able to, uh, between yourself and uh, Michelle and the folks uh, at the CNIB Frontier Accessibility, you're the kind of resources that we need in order to be able to put that all in perspective because there's no way that we could understand what product matches what needs. So thank you for presenting that, Peter. Okay, and I guess we're um, Andrea and Marianne. Are you coming back with CNIB material, or has yes. Michelle got some other uh, stuff from from Humanware to present? We're on to me now. Is that right? Yes, Marianne. That is. Marianne. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right I'm going to see um, if I can if I can uh, request. Yep. If, if Peter, can... if you can stop your screen sharing. Peter, yeah, there. there you there go. go. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> he, like he said, he was, was hanging on to the very last. Was, like, let everyone wasn't see that I was very control. thankful until uh, you know, just have the word, have, the, have my thank you slide up there forever. Uh, okay, thanks so much. Oops, 
that's not what I thought would happen. Everybody can see all my exciting emails. Um, it's joking, of course, it's not very exciting at all. So thanks a lot, uh, and, and for Peter, because yeah, I was really enjoying hearing all that, which I'm sure I've forgotten most of it, but that was, uh, it was really neat to see that perspective. I am here, I, if anybody can, might remember from the beginning of all, after all that detail. So I am the navigation and wayfinding specialist. And my role didn't always exist until a couple of years ago. And just to give you a bit of background, how we, uh, how my sort of area came about was very organic. It wasn't sort of like with all this history you guys have in the education department of trying hard to find, fill all the holes and the needs. It's, it's came about because in 2017, CNIB opened up our first hub, a community hub, which was trying to adapt to the needs of the community and, and have it be a, a offer a place that was more welcoming and like whereas in our traditional offices were places where uh, people didn't really go that often. Maybe they came to get their free Metro pass or whatever connected with the right service, but that's it. But we opened up a mobile hub, not mobile hub, pardon me. We are opening up mobile hubs, but the first one was a community hub, which is sort of a place to go. And, and we decided we wanted to have something, sorry, let me switch the uh, you can see how competent I am with these online presentations. That's a better view. Um, we wanted to have a, an inviting place and we just, they tried a, a little project called Shop Talk, which was inspired by another project over in New Zealand where they, they looked at the neighborhood and it had a, a lot of different retail stores and or, things like that. But they weren't really that available and they copying the New Zealand project what they did was they provided with a grant from the McCanson Foundation, they provided these little beacons uh, to anybody who wanted it. And they created these wayfinding messages that helped to maybe describe the entrance. And then once you're inside, what's the layout, any really important information that one needs to independently go into the store. And then I, I think one of the biggest installations that got feedback for us was the actual TTC station, it's, which is the St. Clair. If anybody happens to be familiar with Toronto, St. Clair is a very complicated station with three different levels. It's all over the place. And we put about 19 beacons in there. And those beacons became incredibly useful for somebody who maybe they're familiar with the station near them, but they're, they're often very nervous going to a new place. But um, people started to feel comfortable traveling and exiting from St. Clair Station, knowing that they had those beacons that with, with the Blind Square app, it would actually tell them where they are and what's around them uh, and the information that they need in order to make a decision. And that actually was huge for people to know that they had that there in order to actually venture into these confusing, disorienting stations. So from that, we, had, we were quite surprised at the amount of feedback we got from individuals and from demand from corporations and organizations that were just at that period of really looking at how can we, how can we increase our service? And so from that, my role came about. So Blind Square is the, for, on the screen, I should say, um, we've got three uh, names of, part of our community partnerships. <clears throat> the um, Good Maps is our newest one, and it is also a navigation app, which is a, it works a little bit differently, and it's for the very complex uh, places like a mall, an airport, maybe a campus, something with many, many, where you really want somebody to tell you point to like, almost like a, a Google routing, um, how to get from here to there inside a very complex building using, uh, using camera positioning technology. Key to Access is uh, an organization that started out with um, accessible pedestrian crossings, which was they used with, through their phone you could actually remotely access the pedestrian streetlight, which is something that was, they were trying to just make, simplify the process, not just for people who are blind, but those who maybe they're in a wheelchair and they can't reach, maybe they don't have the ability to use their hands or the dexterity. And as probably a lot of you are aware that the accessible pedestrian crossings are so inconsistent. Each municipality tends to try their own thing and it's, it's a, it's a real headache. So Key to Access was, was looking at how can we provide the access from their phone. Um, they have now moved on. Well, they still have licensed that 
uh, system to Polera, which is the largest distributor of crosswalks, which is fantastic because that will help to provide a little bit of universality. And um, they have now focused on their remote door opener technology, which is the same idea, but it's this, uh, instead of having to, to look for a button or a plate, they can use the button, they can use their app to remotely activate the door opener. It means you don't have to look around. It also means you don't have to come into high, um, come into contact with these high touch surfaces. So now that has another purpose added on. And key to access also works very well with our most talked about partnership, which is Blind Square. Blind Square is the GPS navigation and indoor navigation app when a uh, customized app that we have became involved with for our shop talk technology. And now we are a partner with them um, to deploy nationally based on, based on need and based on demand. Key to access can actually work very well with Blind Square so that you can both um, activate a smart door or activate a door remotely. And then it can serve as a beacon and describe the entrance. So I'm just gonna move forward here. Um, I don't wanna get too into the details, but the, um, this just talks about the components of Blind Square which is there's the GPS, which is the general um, accessible navigation for outdoors. And that uses the open source technology. And it just it uses sort of wrapper language and algorithms to make it um, more optimized for somebody who is blind or partially sighted as they're walking around to navigate independently. But it, it didn't address the frontier of the, fr of the doorway, which means as you, as you pass through I don't know, a subway station or anything, your GPS is no longer working for you and you're in, in the dark again, so to speak. And now you have to rely on memorizing the location or you have to ask for help and, and hope you feel comfortable asking for help and getting it. So in addition, in order to address that gap, there are different, different components that Blind Square has added on. The beacon positioning system, which is the, the one that gets all the attention is where we use these Bluetooth beacons to mount inside these locations either just one per location so it describes the indoor layout or maybe point to point if there's many decision points that as you come to each area, it'll tell you where you are and what's around you, all the information you need to point your body somewhere and, and make a decision, which is incredibly invaluable. And the customized locations service, otherwise called CLS, is also GPS. However, it's filling the gap between the general information that might be available from a Google standpoint or open maps or whatever, and creating the same style of messages, but addressing the huge gap of what they used to say the final few meters, but as we're finding it's often more than a few meters, it's, it can be hundreds of meters, depending on how accurate the outdoor general information is or open source, such as, as Google. So again, the beacon positioning system gets all of the attention. On screen here uh, in the bottom corner, there is a little picture of a beacon. It's about six centimeters by six centimeters square. It's pretty flat, only a couple um, cent, maybe a little more than a centimeter in depth. And it's eggshell white. The, the image here actually has a serial code and QR code, but they don't usually have anything on top on the, the side that faces out. They are programmed with indoor wayfinding information and they use Bluetooth low energy. So that means it's the battery is quite, uh, power needed is quite low. They can often last a couple of years depending on the model or how many batteries you're using. And all it does is it provides the audible messaging to a user when in proximity to a beacon. And they don't actually have to have a Wi-Fi connection in order to recognize it. They just have to have updated or turned on their app sometime recently so that they have in the area, so that they have the information that is cloud-based for their region. And then all they have to, the app has to do is recognize which app it is. And it will tell them, oh, you are in TTC St. Clair Station. Ahead of you is the concourse. First left it, or is, or the stair, the descending stairs on the left are gonna take you down to the subway platform. The doorway on the right is gonna take you to the streetcar pickup area and so on. Um, this is an example of where it can be used on a, a campus. So th there's a little bit of a, a floor plan here. It's just one building, but as we know, campuses can be incredibly complex. And I have some little Bluetooth icons that represent optional beacon areas. Uh, so for example, there's some in the vestibules and after you might turn a corner to the hallway, there's another beacon, which will give you a new message. And it'll say something like, as you enter from, from one side, it'll say, now I'm building L, first floor, main lobby, elevator, four meters at 12 o'clock, then on right, 
Washrooms and Classrooms L1004 to L1007, first right. Corridor to Student Learning Commons, first left. Note, small flight of descending stairs. Stairwell and Classrooms L1012 L1 to L1006, second right. East vestibule entrance, opposite end of main lobby. So it's a pretty boring sounding message. And yet that information, especially upon entry, you'll find the most um, verbose messages on entry is incredibly useful to somebody who is navigating independently. They won't necessarily be listening and, and um, digesting all of that. But if they're looking for classroom L1000 and um, let's say five, they'll be hearing those options and knowing, okay, I got to go to the stairwell on, on the right. And then from there, they'll move on to the next message. And just each, each section tells them this person takes a right. And then it's going to say in the, as they turn, washrooms on left, entrance to men's, followed by door to single use successful washroom, then entrance to women's, and so on. So they're, they're going to be listening to the information that they need in order to uh, go where they need to know. Uh, if they're listening well enough, now they know might know where the washroom is, so they don't have to ask for help, and so on. So it's just an example of how how th this information could really make a difference in somebody's life. Now, I'm going to kind of elaborate here a little. There's another user experience slide here. Sorry, I meant to go back. Um, here we go. I'm going to go back. No, actually, this is this is the same idea. And this is an example of an actual installation at the Service Canada site in uh, Young and Shepherd, where they're they're trying to pioneer some more accessibility. There's two pictures. One on the left is the building that it's in, 4900 Young Street. And uh, for those who are sighted, they can see it's it's not it does not abut the sidewalk. It is um, you're it's sort of diagonal from the corner. There's uh, descending steps, a little bit of cluttered image, so you can't quite make it out. There's also somewhere hidden there, there's a ramp near the corner. There's a bunch of trees growing out of these um, sort of garden things that are elevated. The, the actual entrance is set back about 35 meters. Um, to somebody who's sighted, it's, you quickly can make a visual scan of this area and you would be able to make very quickly know, make a plan in your head. So if, you, if you're happy, using steps, you're gonna go down those steps and walk forward for a while, and then you're gonna hit a door. But for somebody who's blind, those final few meters, as we say, actually adds a lot of extra time to a location that you're not familiar with. And with technologies like these, where we, we're trying to react to the demand that has come from, the, from our shop talk and from other requests, it, um, these offerings are more about respecting the individual's time and the value that that is the value of that in their day of, you know, something being changed because of construction or just bad directions could at, literally add an hour to somebody's travel time because of the, the confusion of information and maybe the lack of resources to help them with it. And we also there's always going to be those individuals that no matter how great the technology we offer them, if there is an offer of a human element, you know, to provide sight a guide or just tell them what they need to know, they'll take it. And that's wonderful. But we want to respect the individual's autonomy so they don't have to always ask for help or rely on someone or just want to be antisocial. So in the example here, we've got the potential, the distance and the angle from the sidewalk will make the entrance difficult to locate. But the clues that we have for our messaging is descending stairs, the ramp, and the pillars. So with those in the messaging, it can, by describing that, uh, the individual actually has those clues to use to help navigate, to get a sense of how to find their way to the door. So in this example there, we have John, who's never been to this location, and he reaches the address where normally it would just say roughly Google Maps, or, or it would say you're, you're here. Um, and that might be enough for most people, but for those who are like John, um, they might need some more information. And this message would say now at 4900 Young Street, Joseph Shepherd Building, Service Canada Centre on site, two small flights of descending stairs to courtyard, then 36 meters at 11 o'clock, three entrance doors available, ramp at right of stairs, about three meters, continuous banister on left, and the ramp, can, ramp pardon me, continues around left to courtyard, three entrance doors on right, about 35 meters. So again, it's a lot of information, but John will be hearing the what he needs in order to know, okay, I'm gonna go downstairs. I'm gonna be walking, expect to walk for a little while, roughly ahead of me, but slight left in order to find that door. 
and that would actually save him a lot of time. I'm going to jump out so we can move around to different examples here because the beacons get a lot of attention. However, as I mentioned, the CLS, the CLS points, which is the outdoor navigation, is incredibly important for the same reasons that I mentioned. In fact, that was a CLS um, example because he wasn't inside the building yet. Um, here we have. Um, here's sorry, I'm bouncing around a little bit. Um, we're one of our priorities is trails, and that has just increased since COVID. We have um, areas like outdoor trails, which we have some amazing trails in Canada, um, is something that is we take for granted from a, being a sighted person myself that uh, you, if you're blind or partially sighted, you can't go by yourself unless you have it memorized. And because it's, it's not mapped the same way as a road, and there's not the same kind of clues that we have in these high infrastructure environments in order to um, in, have the joy of being by yourself, especially in these times and independently walking outside and getting fresh air and knowing that you're definitely gonna be able to find your way in and out of it um, because not everybody wants to walk in a loop. They might wanna take a trail that's available in order to get to a different area, but they have to be able to know how to exit it and where they are and understanding how to interpret the environmental language to understand um, is this an actual, uh, is, is it a paved path, a path, the surface changed and does that mean this path is not available? What does this rock mean here? Does this mean, and so on. So in the example of accessible trails, we know that it replaces uh, signage. We tag amenities such as benches, waste bins, water fountains. It labels the decision points directionally, it can, so that if you're walking one way, it's gonna say, this way to the uh, garbage on the left, um, the park ahead of you, uh, route to a different trail is on the right, and it would, can reverse it if you're coming the other way. It identifies crossings directionally, oops, sorry, and uh, potential hazards. Um, it can you know, mention this trail isn't, isn't maintained, um, which is important to know for ice and other, other surface dangers. It helps interpret, as I mentioned, the surface changes and physical structures. And it provides additional content as an optional secondary message to the user. So instead of inundating the user with uh, too much audio description, it'll provide a default message that we try to keep brief. So it's what, what, where are you? What's around you? What do you absolutely need to know? But if there is a lot more content available, they can swipe down or they can vertically double shake. And it might actually provide a lot more detail for them if they want it. And a good example of that might be in a lot of these parks, um, they have these signs that might describe the wetlands and the type of birds here and things, and just really um, interesting content if they want to hear it, uh, that, that can be made available and there's an infinite amount of space available. So here's an example of Lois Hole, which is in Alberta, near Calgary, in Alberta parks. Um, these On the screen, there is a kind of blurry image of sort of a, not quite aerial view, but it's a satellite view of the entrance to Lois Hole. And there's a couple pins and some dots. The smaller circles, sorry, dot, dot, circles. The smaller circles, which are green, are what we call the radius. So that's the area where we're tagging the POI, the point of interest. It might say uh, bench or garbage, outhouse, whatever. And then the big red circle is the alert distance. So what that means is as you enter the bubble of that alert distance, it will actually generate a, an orientation message for you. So if you uh, enter the circle of near this outhouse here on the sort of upper right area, um, it'll actually automatically say outhouse three meters at two o'clock. Um, and in the example I showed here, I said that it's, you, Oh, actually, those who are watching can see, they won't see what's on my screen that's covering it. But there are some stones across the beginning of the pathway. And somebody might be confused by the presence of those stones, but actually they're, they, they are there just to block vehicular traffic. So by uh, being able to provide that information, they know that this is in fact the start of the trail. They're not meant to, to, to avoid that. It can tag the waste in the recycling bins. And here they actually have a dog waste bag dispenser and it can also describe how to use these animal food containers. Of course, there's grizzly bears and black bears here. So 
there is a specific way to use these containers that is described in the message. And it tags the outhouse, which is of course very useful information. And then here we have um, in St. John's, they're upgrading their Kelly's Brook trails. So as uh, the example here is uh, there's a decision point um, in the path. So it says junction, baseball diamonds on left, Kelly's Brook trail continues ahead. And then on the right, we have a crossing. So how it looks is kind of like um, narrow path. It's sort of gravelly and there's um, fences on either side. And ahead, you can see a street crossing where it's joining up again with the roads. And in the example message, it says street crossing five meters ahead. So they got that warning, uh, remote access to street light available. So that way they know that they can use the uh, key to access app or the PED app, which is the, the Polara created app, which uses the same technology. So they don't have to go searching around for uh, the, the button for the street light, which is often in very inconsistent places. And they can both activate the street light and be notified that the street light has indeed activated and it, and the, it will describe the area around it. Uh, oh, there's more examples than I realized. So in, in this case, there was the hazard. Um, so in the picture on the left, there's some well, a lot of foliage from above that hasn't been maintained and it really hangs low on the, the left side, the weight of it, I guess, drags it down. So the example message says, caution, low hanging branches overhead, favor right for higher clearance. And on the right, um, it just it just again explains the environment by saying surface change trails continues ahead on grass. So somebody who senses the end of the pavement might wonder if that means that this trail ends, but in fact, it just changes to grass. Um, so I just wanted to switch over to we have talked a little bit about uh, Kita Access and a fair bit about Blind Square. Um, I am going to take an attempt at showing the video for Good Maps because Good Maps is another another navigation app that some people would wonder why I have two. As I mentioned earlier, they have different strengths. They uh, Blind Square uses kind of lighthouse decision point or waypoint technology where we, we like to really keep it simple. There's a lot of new navigation apps out there that use beacons or they use other uh, technology and they kind of go pretty hard on the uh, the sophisticated technology trying to do a little too much um pardon me uh they used there used to be several that tried to triangulate your location with uh with many beacons so that they can clap onto your your mobile device figure out exactly where you are where you're moving to and give you all these instructions based on that Triangle suggests there's three, but to really do it well, you need a minimum of seven on you at all times. So you can imagine this is fairly complicated. Uh, we, we have never favored that. We've done, as I mentioned, the waypoint where you, you approach the area of this beacon. It's designed um, either to have a small radius or large radius based on how we want it to work. Small obviously means more accurate, but that means you also have to know where uh, you actually have to walk into the area to hear it. Um, large would be, you know, maybe you're entering a general area, like a station with a large open area. And we want to make sure that as you enter, we're giving that description, which is sort of like a really brief, maybe a replacement for a sighted guide. If, if you could provide sighted guide to every single person who walks in here who needs it, what would be the general description you, you give to them as they enter this area? You could make it fairly complex by having the directional mentions that I alluded to earlier. So if they're the compass on their phone faces within this range, it gives directions based on that. You know, here's your entering information, here's your exiting. You could also even link the beacons so that if you know, oh, you came from this beacon, so this is the information. But uh, we simple is best whenever possible. Um, however, Good Maps uses it sort of it also has the outdoor navigation but its strength is, is uh, more complex internal um, installations with many, many routes and decision points such as an airport is an example, or a mall or a hospital or a, uh, a campus where especially campuses is a really good example because unlike malls where everything is kind of on display and it's just which floor is it at, which area is it at, and you keep walking, look left to right, or listen left to right until you hear what you want. Campuses can be incredibly complex and they don't do the grid pattern usually. <clears throat> uh, those of us recited often get lost where 
with good maps, unlike Blind Square, it, uh, Blind Square does not provide routing. It doesn't tell you where to go. It just tells you what's around you. Good maps, on the other hand, not only does it provide the sort of look around features where as you're walking, it will mention you know, what's to your left. And if you turn your phone, it'll, it'll uh, describe what you're looking at or what your phone is looking at. But it also, sorry about this constant um, swallowing. It also um, can actually give you a route similar to, to Google Maps. And to our frustration, people confuse it with Google Maps because it sounds so similar. If you, if you Google good maps, Google Maps will come up. Uh, so you have to really say, no, I did mean good maps to Google and in order to find information about it. I'm just going to try to provide their example here because I think this is, the video is the better, uh, gives a better idea than how I describe it. So please let me know if, oh, here we are. Um, are we able, can somebody through chat or let me know if we're able to see the new screen, which is the video. See it, okay. All right, I'm gonna press play, let's, is good map and I'm not hearing the sound. Point your phone to hear what's in a direction. Look at Bourbon entrance, 43 feet. Comfy cow counter, 28 feet. Starbucks entrance, 61 feet. Louisville slugger entrance, 54 feet. Sure, Church, today Even entrance, though I'm not hearing the sound, so I'm not sure it's not working feet. out how I wanted it to. Valuable directions for both blind and sighted users. Oh, sound is good. Okay. Go left. Continue 16 feet. Go straight through bottom of main downward escalator. Continue 53 feet. Go straight through top of main downward escalator. Continue 20 feet. Go right. Continue 13 feet. Go left. Continue 97 feet. Go 10 o'clock. Continue 24 feet. Go right. Continue 60 feet. Arrived at destination. Good Maps Explorer utilizes camera-based positioning, a revolutionary technique that relies on geo-referenced images and AI to provide easy installation and precise positioning. This provides a vast improvement in accuracy and eliminates the need for beacons and other infrastructure. The power of getting unlost depends on accessible navigation. I need to hear what is around me in order to know my options. Navigating routes independently is liberating as it can be frustrating to find or wait for sighted assistance. In addition to making spaces more accessible for people who are blind, we are also focused on solutions that address safety and productivity. Our team is hard at work on solutions that provide spatial information for first responders and on a contact tracing solution that allows the user to visualize all dangerous points of contact within their venue to help address the COVID crisis. To make your venue more productive, we're embedding a range of facility management tools, including assets. Okay, so I think that that's the idea. I hope, um, I said start video, I was confused there. Um, it's been a while since I've had to host. So I, it was weird for me because I couldn't hear the sound and yet uh, everybody on the other end could hear it, but I hope that was a, well, hearing it, that you that was a good demonstration of how Good Maps is a little bit different, but the potential use cases of something like that, where they could really kind of guide you step by step and give you that confirmation that you're on the right course. So that's, I think, I want to kind of pause here to see if there's any questions at this point. I didn't pay attention to when I started talking, so I don't have a great sense of how long I've been talking, but um, is there any questions even for what I should elaborate? Oh, actually, one thing I did not explain very well is with the Blind Square solution, which I'm, I spent a lot of time talking about, well, one question that comes up a lot is um, the, the onus on the user to pay for the app. We say Blind Square, which started out originally as a paid app. I think on average, it's around $55 Canadian. And so that's um, in the US, that would be, I don't know, around $40. And um, obviously we would, as an organization, CNIB, we would never be involved with any installation that requires that um, the end user to pay additionally. So we have to say Blind Square event because any sort of installation that we customize installation become involved with, it creates a geo fence, a virtual geo fence so that anywhere within the area that's identified, uh, users have access to the, the 
free version of the app called Blind Square Event. And it provides the full functionality of Blind Square, which is uh, everything that a, a paid Blind Square has, but it's just that you, you have to be within the location for it to be able to work. Otherwise, it's in demo mode or simulation mode. But one of the cool features you can do, even sitting at home, if you're nowhere near a geofence, is you can pick a location that you're planning to go to for the first time, and you can simulate the location, and you can actually get familiar with this location in advance, which to a lot of people mean, makes a big difference with their confidence to be able to know when they're in this area, they have an idea of what coffee shop is around. Um, and Good Maps has the same I same functionality. I forget if they call it, uh, I don't think they call it simulation on they call it virtual mode. And that even works for the installations that we have done. So in the example of our, our head office that we have an installation in, um, we, you can actually travel point to point. You can pick a route and then listen to, as it describes the route for you so that you can actually get to know the building of some, or any of the buildings that they have already completed in order to get a sense of how it works before you even visit the location. The Good Maps app is also free. Um, I think there is not even a paid version of that. Good Maps used to be nearby Explorer, which was paid, um, but uh, it was created by, um, it was <laughs> just, uh, I'm, I'm blanking here on the, on the biggest organization in the States, um, National Printing House, NVH, that, the, that created that, they created New Bar Explorer, and that has now been evolved into Good Maps, um, which uses a camera positioning system, so it's a little different. It does use beacons just to help the user know which in, indoor installation they are approaching, and then it lines it up with all the routing and the mapping internally that you've created. And then from there, it actually uses the uh, camera system of the end user, but without actually recording any data. It's, um, it just uses that to match with its own information about the building. And with that, it understands where it is, where it's facing, and it constantly updates um, where you need to go and, and turn and so on. So it's a very different technology. They only use the beacons to um, connect itself with the with the type of information that's provided um, with the LIDAR scan or created with the LIDAR scan we use, but the camera system is actually what tells the app where you are and where you need to go. So I just wanted to get into that before I fully answer questions because that one always comes up that anything we're involved with, the end user would not be paying. There has to be a free version available, but I did see that there's one question already yes. yeah the doug has asked not me another doug um, we have to stick mm -hmm. together though um, doug has asked what strategies uh, are suggested uh, for battery saving on devices uh, when you're doing all of this wayfinding and using the uh, the the uh, multi-functions of your of your phones yeah that's a good question um because the the newer models i hate to say upgrade your phone because uh that's not that's not always a financially good option. The newer models are better with the battery uh, saved. I actually did look into this, and I wish I could remember the the tips. It's been a while since I've worked with somebody directly, so I'm not fresh. Uh, the screen curtain, by the way, does not help with saving batteries. All that does is provide privacy. That was something I learned in investigating this this question. You can turn off. Um, no, you can't turn off Bluetooth. There. Yeah, that, I, that is a really good question. Some people actually travel with a battery pack, a very light one, those power banks that help. The important thing too is that as soon as you're done, that you, that you don't need anymore, that you fully close the app and maybe even if, like say you're, you've arrived at the meeting or where you need to go, turn off your GPS. That's what I do. Turn off your GPS. Anything I'm not using, turn it off and make sure you fully close the app. Um, but it is a it is a really good question. I do know that the besides upgrading the model of the phone, these apps become leaner every time that they they update. One of the goals is usually to become leaner so that it's not creating such a, a demand on the operating system of the phone. Um, I personally use an iPhone seven, which in at least um, in Canada amongst our uh, our participants, uh, CNIB participants who are blind and partially sighted, is still the most common model. For um, and for Blind Square, it is only available on iOS, like many accessible apps, just because of the fragmentation issue 
of Android. However, Good Maps is available on both apps. Um, <clears throat> but the seven has been, um, is, it does have the battery issue I find. And the, um, so some, occasionally some, one of the updates will actually make it a little worse, but then they'll, they'll sort of patch in and make it a little leaner to, if they've had to do a major upgrade, you might find the batteries going down uh, faster, but then they'll sort of patch in um, a, an upgrade that will hopefully rely less on the demand on the operating system. Sorry, I didn't have a great answer for that one. Other than the more sophisticated each app gets, um, the less, uh, the leaner it is on the firmware. That's great. I appreciate that uh, that information and a few tips in there. And uh, sounds like um, that there needs to be some uh, coordination between uh, between everybody involved in, in maybe uh, figuring out how if there was a tip sheet or anything like that in existence. Um, uh, if, if uh, anybody comes across a tip sheet on, on this uh, particular uh, topic for saving the battery and, and, and that using all these apps, that would be great if you could share it um, or somebody who wishes to take that under their, uh, um, under their wing and, and uh, add it to their to-do list. <laughs> so thanks for that question though, Doug and, and Marianne. Um, just remind everybody to put your questions into the chat. Uh, we're coming to a close in about five minutes or so here. So um, if you're adding your questions into the chat and as promised uh, when we started today that uh, during this question and answer period um, is by all means unmute yourself if you'd prefer to ask the questions uh, by voice. And when we see that the uh, the microphones are unmuted, then I will uh, I will certainly call on you. Um, and just as we do this, I'm just going to take the screen sharing back from you there, uh, Marianne. Sure. And um, if it seems to be the day of of all the the uh, mouse clicks, there we go. <laughs> I, was having I will say my... um, to other Doug Doug Heyman that your question did remind me of a great tip, though we found. Um, somebody who is partially sighted and loves using his uh, phone and technology. He works at a major phone company. He said, most people don't realize, at least at his company, which is Bell, um, they provide up to three gigabytes a month for free for people who are blind or have a disability that would benefit for wayfinding purposes. And it's one of those things where he said, no, you don't, they don't advertise it. You have to ask for it because if you're ever talking to your salesperson, they're not gonna offer that as it's not beneficial for them to offer it. But if you know what to ask for it, almost all companies have something like that. So if you are using these apps and you do have a disability, it is worth uh, um, reaching out and saying, do you have something for wayfinding to provide uh, this data for free? That's a wonderful tip, Marianne. Thank you for, uh, for that. Um, as well, it's it's worth worth uh, much more than the price of admission to this uh, to this webinar today. <laughs> um, Thanks. Yeah. So um, I, again, just a reminder to unmute if you'd like to ask your questions by voice or to add them into the chat, and uh, just uh, bring Andrea back in here as well. She's still with us, and Michelle is still with us. Um, as we're rounding things out, if there's questions for any of uh, the three of them, uh, Marianne, Andrea, or Michelle, um, or if there's anything that the, uh, the three of you would like to share with the audience. Uh... I must have something. I'm just trying to think of what to say. <laughs> There's been an immense amount of information here today uh, from all of our presenters and I feel like I need a wayfinding app to figure out, to, to, to even begin to evaluate all this information. Um, it's, 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 it's immense. So we, we've left you speechless, Andrea. Well, I just think, you know, it's interesting when you hear about all that goes into trying to figure out the appropriate messaging when it comes to wayfinding. Um, there's a lot to know. And Marianne, um, can we even direct people to clearing our path? Just as some, you know, to provide some basic knowledge about how to, or what to consider um, when it comes to um, making an accessible space? Yeah, are you asking me for the link? Or is it is it clearing our path? Or can you just, you know, briefly yeah. write what it is? Clearing Our Path actually is predates Frontier. It's uh, a project that was done. I'm just going to add in, it literally is just clearingourpath.ca. It was a project that was done um, to basically provide a resource 
for anybody who facilities, uh, planners, architects, engineers, just to keep in mind here are here's the guy here's the guidelines here's the standards and here's maybe even going a little beyond the guidelines because uh, I think for I don't I might be wrong here but as an example I think the basic minimum for having stairs is that you have to have an alert strip at the top but not at the bottom however CNIB we say both because you don't just need to know where maybe there's a little bit less risk of, of danger if you fall at the top. So it, you still need to know when to, when the stairs end. It's, you can definitely still trip and, and fall and, and hurt yourself. Um, it's good to know. Uh, there is an old O&M, which is orientation mobility, would, would suggest, oh, you use your cane to sense where the floor ends. So you, you should have it ready. However, not everybody uses a cane and not everybody uses it well. So and those who are uh, partially sighted and don't necessarily need a cane, but that, that's where problems can happen. So clearing our path, which I put in there, it, it's, a, it's just a resource to give not just the minimum, but the suggestions as well. Great, appreciate that. Uh, any other uh, um, thoughts or comments in closing from either Andrea, Marianne, or Michelle? And again, inviting the audience to add their questions or unmute. So reminding everybody that's, uh, that has registered, there will be the replay link sent out so that you can digest all of the, uh, the immense amount of information that's been shared today, that you can digest it in a little more of um, at your leisure, maybe slow down the replay and, uh, and go through all of the, the various models and, uh, and details uh, that were shared earlier uh, with us by Peter for all of the, the um, equipment that HumanWare has available. And then we'll also be sharing it with uh, the slide presentations and the contact information for uh, Michelle, uh, Peter, and uh, Marianne and Andrea as well. So, okay. So, um, so we are coming to a close today um, for today's uh, session. And uh, just as we do wrap up, I, I want uh, definitely to thank, uh, thank all of our presenters, uh, Andrea, Marianne, Michelle, Peter, for you being here today. Um, Again, I, I can't stress the, uh, the amount of information is just overwhelming and uh, to be able to have uh, your, your, yourselves as individuals and the teams that you represent um, to be able to uh, help us as resources and be a, be a go-to uh, for when we have questions, it, it will be invaluable. So uh, again, so, so thankful for, uh, for your involvement and your support here today. Um, is as, as assistive technology professionals, we're always looking uh, for, for resources, different tools, knowledge of what's out there, and because we can never have too much information. So, and this is obviously going to just uh, fill up our toolboxes even more than they already are. And that's the way we like them. We like them to be overflowing. So, um, so again, just a reminder to everybody that this has been the uh, part two of the three-part vision showcase. And if you haven't registered for part three, please visit the uh, Network of Assistive Technologist event site and uh, do register for part three, which is next Friday. Andrea will be returning with a few of her colleagues and the folks from Vispero. So, um, yeah, so uh, as we do finish here, Andrea, Marianne, Michelle, any final thoughts? Just uh, Andrea, I just wanted to say again, thank you so much for the opportunity. And um, yeah, we, I so appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing people next Friday. Yeah, thank you all. And actually, as you I was clicking in and found one of the tips for blind squares sleep mode. Um, so that it does, it only wakes up when you when you ask it to. So I found one quick tip for you, and of course, turn, turning off the the functions when you don't need them of of enabling uh, Bluetooth and all that. So that's my thank you and goodbye. And I just want to thank everybody for joining in on behalf of Peter had to leave. Thank you very much. And remember, uh, we're here to help, help support you guys. Any questions can be directed to any me, Peter, and Andrea for sure. Have a great weekend, guys. Great. Thank you, everyone. And uh, hopefully, Marianne, you'll be able to share that tip with us uh, so that we can add it into the replay resources. So, okay. Again, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us. And remember, you can't spell education without AT.